Hello everybody, I'm Billy Abbott, I am the Whiskey Exchange's Ambassador and I'm joined today by Ian McAllister, the Distillery Manager, Master Distiller, man who does all the things at Grand Scotia Distillery. So, good morning uh, Ian, how are you doing today? I'm very well, I'm very well, and yourself Billy? It's a lovely morning. Just, just about hanging in there, just about. So. Anyway, so what we really want to know about is, is yourself and how you got into the whiskey world, how you've you know, got to Grand Scotia what stuff you do there so where did you start off in the wonderful world of whiskey oh billy i i had uh i i guess my journey has been um a certain amount of uniqueness uh, i guess with glen scotia obviously i started in 2008 at glen scotia uh, i've never worked anywhere else uh, and it was it, you know it's then this has changed so much even than that you know 12, 12 years and so many months that I've been here. Um, when I started at Glen Scotia, there was uh, there was just three of us here. There was no sales. There was no marketing. Uh, so it was very much a you know a, a, a distillery that was operating, but only just. Um, so it, yeah, it was fantastic. You know to see where we were then, and you know obviously where we've we've came to at this point has has been. Yeah, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a fantastic journey for me. It really has. Amazing. So back then when you started out, you were just ticking over. I know it was, it was back in the days with the previous owners. And so were, were you producing loads of whiskey? Or was it just like, you know, a little bit of here and there? Or, or how's it working? Oh, it, 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 was, it was very sporadic to say the least. Uh, as I say, when I started, there was a Stillman and a Marshman, uh, both fantastic guys. The Stillman's now since retired, Jim, Jim Grogan. The Marshman's still here, David Watson. Uh, he's worked for the company for an incredibly uh, long time. Um, and we were probably producing at the maximum of about 80,000 litres. We'd run three marshes a week. Uh, with a lot of issues, a lot of technical issues. My background is engineering, uh, so it was. It, I guess it was up by street in a certain respect. Um, we had to look at different uh, different aspects of wash parts, change wash parts, condensers, repaired stills, changed pumps, uh, upgraded the mill. So pretty much everything. The the brewing tanks, boiler, <laughs> absolutely everything was done. Um, and it was over a, a course a few years, I've got to say, obviously, for the, the financial side, Billy. But yeah, it, it was fascinating, you know, and it was really, you know, I, I consider it an incredible privilege to, you know, obviously start, start here, start here as a novice, a rookie, uh, and be allowed to obviously have that free reign, you know, even up to the Loch Lomond Group and beyond that, where we are today, still get that uh, free reign, you know, just, do what we've got to do, and it, yeah, I say a certain amount of uniqueness to it, you know, to be allowed to do that. So, yeah, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. It really is. Everything about it has been, you know, it's been so interesting and so engaging. Um, you know, it takes up your your life. Um, ask my dear wife; <laughs> she loves <laughs> for that. But yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, from that, that point to where we are now, half a million litres, yeah, it's amazing. You know, it's been an incredible journey, but you said you have an engineering background. So were you working in whiskey beforehand or were you doing other things before you, you went to go in Scotia? No, I, no, no, no whiskey before that. I, I, I worked with the Scottish water. So I was born and bred in Campbelltown. I've spent uh, all my days here, uh, Billy, uh, and it was... Uh, for me, you know, whiskey always interested me. You know, the the, the a combination of the history of Campbelltown because I knew about it, obviously. And uh, being born in a distiller's mansion as half the town where you know was was normal practice in Campbelltown, so it gives you a flavour how <laughs> how important and how you know it, the, the whiskey is everywhere. It, it does you know it does run through your veins in a certain respect. Um, so yeah, I, I was, you know, obviously from that point, it was, you know, it was, it was a historical aspect. It was the engineering aspect. Um, I could definitely see the potential in Glen Scotia, you know, because even in the early days when uh, I was here and obviously I was, I was trying to get grips with the, the place and the process. 
Um, the guys were obviously keeping me right in these early days. Um, it was, you still seen the diehard Green Scotia fans who would turn up at the gate, you know, and they, they, they were in love with the place. Even in its dishevelled and tumble down appearance, it, it, it was. It still had that pedigree, you know. It still had the the that Campbell Town, um, you know, that all the Campbell Town over overtones were there. So it was, yeah, it was. It was really all that. It drew me here, you know. It really was fantastic place, fantastic retail. I was up a couple of years back and came out to the distillery. I remember just walking down the road and you know, just up, you know, literally just round the corner from you. We've seen the distillery walking up the hill and sort of going. That's an old distillery, and just like looking at the buildings as you walk along, and going, "That's a distillery." That, that that was probably a distillery as well. Everywhere, you know, Campbelltown's history for distilling is just, you know, it runs really deep. It it does, it does. You know, and you're right. You know, if you you know you look, and it it doesn't take a great deal of knowledge. You know, if you if you have a look when you're you're out your wander or your walk, you know, even between walking between Springbank, Glen Scotia, or whatever, over to the town there. There's so much association with the whiskey, you know, it really had a, a huge influence, you know, through the 19th century, right up until the, the early part of the 20th century. It was massive, you know, it really was. And it's, 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 it's hard to really get that across, you know, how big it was, you know, there was so many. Um, absolutely, you get a lot of distilleries in other regions. But Campbelltown really had something, something going, you know, they really knew how to make a pound or two, that was for sure. Um, obviously, the Greenleys, is, you know, they started off in distilling and reached Glasgow and London, and shops in London, and uh, Colville's, Mitchell's, and Springbank. So there's huge names in the, the industry, and, and they obviously were, you know, they, they, they were onto it in a big way. They knew how to make a pound from that, that product, that whiskey. Um, so, yeah, and... It, the distilleries themselves, obviously, they weren't huge affairs. You know, some of them were quite small, com compact units, Billy. Um, but, yeah, you know, they, they had it right. They knew exactly what they were about. Uh, and, uh, you know, they obviously capitalised on that. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those places where you wander around, you can sort of almost sort of feel the history of whiskey there. But you're now down to your three distilleries and, you know, in Glen Scotia, until, as you say, until recently, was really you know, a little bit sort of falling down, sort of like very much out of the way. Yeah. So how's it changed, especially since um, the, you know, the Locker Island Group sort of like changed in, um, a few years back and all that new investment and all that sort of like, you know, strengthening of Gun Scotia as a distillery, but as a brand and all that sort of um, expansion. So how's that, how's that sort of affected things and how's that gone over the past few years? It, it, it's been absolutely fantastic. You know, I've really got to say, you know, obviously the investment was needed. Um, as I say, you know, there was obviously a lot of engineering products, projects going on in the, in the past, Billy, for sure. Um, but, you know, obviously up to the present day from uh, 2013-14 onwards, um, there was a real emphasis, obviously, on the, the, the sales, the marketing. Um, I would looked at the... the the production regime uh, previously uh, with John Peterson, he was basically my boss uh, previously, and John John was very much a, um, John was a scientist really for the want of a better word. You know, really knew his stuff. Big, uh, he had a big influence in yeasts for me, especially. So, um, so yeah, from from that point on, or 2013-14 onward really try to obviously enhance Glen Scotia, you know, really show that spirit quality, show what we can do, you know, the different bottles, obviously, working with Loch Lomond, uh, working with different casks, and 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 really try, just try to put that to the, the fore, because I feel um, previously Glen Scotia was sometimes a hit or a miss, the one, you know, for the one of a better word, because um, it, a lot of the older bottlings were... Some of them are really good, but again, you know, some of them weren't so good. So it's good to obviously just get everything in a, an even keel um, and obviously give it the attention, give it the love that it needs. And, and invariably that involves obviously investment. So, so we're really just trying to progress it and move it on. It's one, 
it's one of the distilleries along with Loch Lomond itself, you know, which you, you've seen over the past few years, really sort of change the approach, put out more incredible whiskies and, you know, drag in new fans. You know, there was always Glen Scotia fans out there, but they're sort of like, you know, a little bit more few and far between. It was these random independent bottlings, but now you guys are putting out your own whiskies with your own sort of stamp of definitely being Glen Scotia on them. And, um, yeah, it's been from the outside. It's been great to watch as well as I'm sure it's been for you sort of like at the center of it all. Absolutely. Yeah. So as distillery manager um, and all the other bits and pieces you do at the distillery. Um, so what I'm going to ask the, the horrible question, which has no particular answer. But so what was the sort of typical day for you when you're um, when you're sort of working at the distillery? Oh, it, it's, you know, it changes all the time, Billy. It really does, you know, and it's, I think that's what it suits my personality because I, I'm always at something, you know, I could be sitting down in front of a computer or I could be working with casks or I could be working through whiskey samples uh, or I could, you know, I could be doing a tour. Or, wide and varied, it really is, and it's, it's, it's huge. Um, I've got to say, obviously, Hector started as, as the assistant manager, so that really takes a lot of pressure off of me with the day-to-day -day running of the distillery. Uh, and I can concentrate more on uh, something that's becoming, as years go by, something that's is becoming a bigger part of my life is the, the whiskey, <laughs> the samples. So it's, uh, that, that, that's really what's really becoming important to me and is, is, is my time goes on, my career goes on at Glen Scotia, there's more emphasis for me, you know, on that, on the whiskey and, and understanding exactly what Glen Scotia is, because absolutely my heart goes off to you guys, you know, obviously a lot of different whiskies, a lot of different distilleries. I'm nearly 13 years down the line and I'm still trying to just understand that, that Glen Scotia. So, that, that's becoming a big part of my daily routine for sure is, you know, the whiskey stocks and, you know, and, and it, trying. It's a hard job, but, you know, somebody's got to do it. So, you know, thank you. Thank you for your martyrdom for us, looking after us, making sure we get good whiskey. So, <laughs> so, so you, you, you are, you're more involved with sort of like cast selection and that sort of thing these days than you were beforehand. Yes, absolutely. It's 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 something you know that obviously is is uh, progressing all the time. You know, so we've got quite a lot of different casts in the go. You know, whether it's uh, working with the festival edition, whether it's obviously distillery editions, or you know dinner bottlings, or you know there's a lot of different aspects you know going on there. So it's uh, and obviously a lot of s smaller projects that obviously I'm. You know, undertaking here, uh, finishing different casks and just looking at casks, and a certain amount of it is, I guess, you know, you would you wouldn't call it experimental work because it's 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 always always going to be something that's going to be used. But it, it, it's just for me, as I say, it's just trying to understand, you know, what we can what we can do and what potentially we can't do. So, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. It really is, and it's you know, and it's it's something for me. It just keeps developing, Billy. So it's, I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, from when you started, so as you said, you know, Glen Scotia was a little bit potentially hit and miss and things like that. And you you start bringing that consistency in. For you, what is you know, what's what's the core of Glen Scotia? What is what is it that makes Glen Scotia Glen Scotia? Well, do you know, it, it's something for me, it's evolved. You know, when I started at Glen Scotia, there was a, a, a huge emphasis on uh, filling first filled bourbons, and we still do that. You know, I think um, even to this day, you know, there's certainly uh, an emphasis on the, the first filled bourbon cask. Um, not only does it complement the Glen Scotia unique spirit, but you do, it enhances the coastal, the maritime, uh, you get lovely fruit flavours, and it's just getting that Campbelltown and um, Glen Scotia balance here, which I, I think is really important. So that's, and the 15-year-old probably in the core range is the closest to that, um, really. So you're really looking to obviously keep that style. So that's the style. Um, that said, um, obviously we do some refills, we do some medium char casks, uh, there's an element of peat in there and some of them too. 
uh, and even refill, some refill American oaks are incredibly interesting. Uh, and actually one of the, probably the next Scotland's I'll take out in the shop is going to be a, a, a refill American oak cask. Uh, and for me, um, it, it's got that Glen Scotia style, um, but it really, it, it takes me back, it takes me back to real old Glen Scotia, potentially the 50s and 60s with that flavour profile. Um, I think we lost our way a little bit in the 80s, potentially with the early 80s, um, you know, that kind of uh, era, potentially into the, the, you know, the early 90s. There was a certain amount of production there, which is, um, which is okay, but it's, it's not quite got that Glen Scotia DNA. So it's, it's, it's just trying to find, you know, what really is that Glen Scotia. And it's, as I say, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so um, most of these, most of these casks, bottlings should, you know, should demonstrate that. Hopefully. <laughs> so that that DNA, that that sort of core thing that is Glen Scotia, you know, you, you it's changed over the years. So you're now putting your stamp on it. What, what, what for you though? What are you? What is that? What are you trying to create with that? What is that? That flavour profile, that spirit. What are you trying to you know, put into that? Well, obviously, what we want, we want something that's, um, you know, it's, it's historically, you know, wh what was that uh, Glen Scotia DNA? And if you, as I say, if you consider the first fill bourbon cask, then that's really close. You know, I think it's got a lovely rounded aspect to it. You know, it's got a, a, a fruit, obviously, a lot to do with the, the fermentations that we do with Glen Scotia. But there's a fantastic... Um, you get obviously certain overtones of vanilla, you get fruit, you get toffee, you get fudge. Um, and I think there's a certain amount of that uh, bourbon association, you know, that really obviously for us is easy to convey as a distillery DNA. Um, but if only it was as simple as that, obviously, as I say, the 15 year old is, you know, that, that, that should be, if you, if you were getting a, uh, a bottle of Glen Scotia from the core range, then absolutely, that 15 year old's fantastic. There is obviously an element of sherry in there, and that's important too, because <laughs> obviously historically, sherry cast played an important part in Campbelltown too. So it, it's really, really difficult trying to get the exact, this is it, this is exactly what they've used, because the chances are it wasn't. Um, that's why I obviously, Get that bourbon cask, uh, potentially a first filled bourbon cask, and the the a combination of the long fermentations, the association of that cask, the type of spirit that we've got now, that should be that should give you that fantastic certain amount of robustness, as I say, that flavour profile, uh, that Campbelltown DNA, which is you know really um, really important. So yeah. it, it's it, it's a tough one, it really is, you know, and it, it takes a incredible amount of work uh, just trying to get it as it should be. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. Again, this is one of these things about Glen Scotia is it has been over the years this sort of shifting target. Yes. And even within your current range, you know, you, you have you go from like the 15 year old through to the Victoriana, which has got a very, very different profile to yeah. the rest of the stuff. And there's just, you know, there's such flexibility in the cast. You've got the spirit you've got laid down. There seems to be it's great range for you to sort of like run around and play and sort of like, you know, choose the flavors you want and create what you want to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think, you know, it's, 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 you've, you've really got to have a, a benchmark, a target, you know, and that's what I feel, obviously the bourbon's got a huge part to play, but you know, as I mentioned, and I, and, and I did this obviously recently with the, uh, the virtual taste and obviously the sherry casks, you know, even casks from the Iberian Peninsula, pork casks, wine casks, they obviously had a huge influence in Campbelltown too. And they were obviously uh, prevalent before anything else was, you know, because obviously they would, they would be easier to access, obviously the Campbelltown strategically placed, you trade. Um, and I mentioned this before, obviously some of the distillers had their own vessels for trade. So they were obviously able to pick certain casks up. Um, obviously never worked the way it's 
it, it works today. Obviously, there would have been a, a, a randomness about it. You know, certain casks would just be uh, purchased purely for the fact that they were casks. You know, they, they would hold liquid. So it's 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 important to obviously consider all these aspects too when you you think of Campbelltown. And that, that's obviously when you you look at the Victoriana, you look at the eighteen year old, you know, even the fifteen year old. So this, there is a, a semblance of all these different factors in there. You know, you're getting the, obviously the the, the sherry pea experts, which potentially you know, would have been, you know, these casks, sherry casks would have been obtainable. Uh, same with bourbon casks. Bourbon casks, obviously, to a certain extent, were obviously a lot further on, but again, they would have been accessible, you know, the Atlantic trade, you know, the ships from Campbelltown, you think nothing of obviously crossing the Atlantic with a cargo, whatever it may be, it could be uh, steel from Glasgow or whatever it was at that time, Billy. Then it would head back potentially to the Mediterranean area and then back to Campbelltown. So really, really accessible. So, that, and I think that's, you know, it really matches up well with all the different flavours that's going on there and, uh, uh, you know, the Glen Scotia uh, uh, core range because it's wide and varied. And so it would have been, you know, it really would have been wide and varied. Um, and saving a certain amount of peat, you obviously consider... Uh, you don't really think a Campbelltown is a huge peat area, you know. Obviously, Isle is the peat heaven, um, but again, you would have, you know, the Glen Scotia has got a lovely um, sinewy peat flavour running through some of these drums, and you would have got that, you know, you would have got that, a hint of that peat going through there, whether they wanted it or not. The chances are there would have been that historically that peat would be in there and. Um, giving it that lovely background. So there's there's so much, you know, and it's really, really, you know, historically, the more you research, the more you find out, and the more you understand that it's not quite as simple as, you know, you you, you may think. Uh, but again, you know, as I said, for me, you know, obviously different flavours, everyone's got their favourite, but I always come back to that first of all, bourbon cask, you know, because I think, you know, obviously, the way it's made, fermentation, even when it's matured in that ugly asbestos warehouse building, is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. You know, it really comes together. You talked about, about the casks and, you know, the, the, that side of the flavour and that, but you, you did one sort of mentioning, just like little, little snippets of sort of like about the fermentation, about the peat. So first of all, what, what is your, your long fermentations? What do they actually give your spirit? How does that affect the, uh, sort of the overall flavour? Well, the fermentations, again, you know, something that I worked on quite a, a number of years, uh, really, over the, over the piece with John, you know, John Peterson. Um, and basically, we've got stainless steel. When I started, it was corton steel, which was mild steel coated with zinc and outside. Um, so... I could never quite understand the theory behind that because obviously they are rust in the inside and they were lovely and clean in the outside. Anyway, we <laughs> changed, changed them over a number of years ago. Uh, we've always had six historically at Glen Scotia. We've now got nine, uh, six inside, three outside uh, Billy. And they're 25,000 litres. I only put a small amount in, so I only put 14,500 litres in there. The yeast balance, uh, 75 kilos of, uh, is a pressed M strain, the original M strain distiller's yeast. Um, but importantly, there's two M, normal reacting yeast, one MX, which is a faster reacting yeast. And the combination of obviously the, the amount, you know, the amount of wort in there, the amount of yeast versus time makes a, you makes a huge difference. Uh, obviously, there's setting temperatures and such like to consider in there too, you know, obviously when you're, you're, the what initially goes in there and how you pitch the yeast, et cetera. But um, as I say, incredibly long, we'll leave them for a batch process. So we'll leave them for a minimum of 70 hours, but in theory we'll go right up to 140 plus hours. So you've really got an average, when you do the maths in there, there's an average of about 128.8 hours uh, over the uh, over the, the ten ten bucks that we'll do in a week, uh, and yeah, 
you know, obviously the way we collect it, the way it's distilled, guys are very, very uh, professional, proficient guys, and it did a fantastic job. The way we collect it, some of the new make is, even though I do say so myself, is 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 wonderful. It really, is wonderful. You know, it's it's, uh, it's full of flavour. Absolutely. You know, the, obviously the cut points, optimum cut points. Absolutely, the, the fruit there is is quite amazing, and obviously that's benefiting from secondary fermentation, lactic acids, etc. And that's when we're really, you know, we, we can concentrate all these higher alcohols um, through distillation, and we get a fantastic array of them. So it's always been like that, you know. Obviously, the distillery itself, Billy, is always run in the same principle. But I just feel we've, we've maybe tidied it up a little bit and we've just, you know, freshened it up a wee bit. It's uh, quite amazing. It really is. That seems to be the thing which increasingly people are you know, now looking at and actually focusing on fermentation. For years, I know there's always the new big thing in, in whiskey. Every year there's like, oh, this is the important thing, you know, whether it's casks or, you know, forbid water every now and again. It's like, oh, yes, uh, oh, water makes the whiskey and all that sort of business. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to be fermentation over the last few years and actually looking at that side of it, creating that flavor early on, so much focus has gone into that. And that's been a really, you know, as, as a geek myself, massive vision uh, about process and flavor. It's been really great to see people focus on that and develop those flavors over time. Absolutely. Yeah. So the other side of it was you, you talked a little bit about peat and, you know, as you say, while your your neighbours down the road um, at the Springbank, they do a little bit of peating here and there. They do some unpeated stuff. So what's your, Glenn's question, what do you do with, with peat? Where, should, where does it sit, sit in the process? Well, do you know, the the, the, the the peated regime, historically, when I started at Scotia, we always used to do the uh, peated runs in March. And I actually started in uh, the end of March 2008. So I actually came on board when we were just, um, finishing the PT run. Uh, we used to do s potentially a couple of weeks. Now we'll probably do a month, so we'll, we'll double that. Um, historically, again, you only get medium and heavily PT at Glen Scotia. Uh, the, oh, the maximum probably up about 30, 40 ppm. Now I tend to work with lightly, medium and heavily. So I'll go from zero to 20 belly and mediums from 20 to 30, uh, and a heavily peated will uh, be beyond that. So the, the, the heaviest peat I've done today is uh, 54.5 parts per million. Uh, and it's, again, you know, the, the, with the association, you know, the, the, the fermentations, the cut points of that, the, the peated runs, uh, and the casks themselves, that first filled bourbon cask, uh, there was a... A heavily peated that I actually started using. It was a 2013. So it was just about the time of the changeover. Uh, and it was just three years old, three years old in a, a day. <laughs> uh, we, we started using that and it was absolutely fantastic. You know, the, the, again, you know, you're, you're getting flavour in there. You're getting the, the Campbelltown Association, the, the oils, and uh, that salinity. Uh, but yet the peat never dominated. The peat's in there. Uh, for heavily peated, it is quite, you know, it's, it's obviously got a fair amount of peat in there, but it's beautifully balanced. Um, so again, for me, it's, it's something that's really, right, okay, that, this is quite interesting because I've got to say initially, a lot of peated whiskies put me off. Peated whiskey. <laughs> uh, but the way this came together, I thought it was really quite interesting. You know, I thought it really, really works well. There's a fantastic balance in here and everything's got its place. Everything comes along, you know, just at the right time. You get the oils, you get the fantastic fruit flavours out of that bourbon cask, uh, and you get that lovely dryness, uh, dry hay off that, that, uh, that, that peat influence there. So uh, again, you know the the I think going to Scotia, you know that a lot of the peated whiskies going forward will really be quite uh, quite important for us. Um, just need to make sure we get the stocks to match that. <laughs> the constant problem of not having enough whiskey. Yeah, 
<laughs> so how do you use that peat in your in your regular range so you know you have things like the victoriana which are sort of like you know more old-fashioned and earthier and sort of you know that big oiliness and you have like the 15 which is like you know this sort of not quite so that sort of side of things you're showing this newer side of Glen scotia how, how how does the peat get used across that range well again you know the the, the obviously the the peat that i've produced uh well even previous to my uh, tenure here it's quite small you know there's obviously certain pockets of peat um but it, again it's it, for the want of a better word really you know it, it, it's, it's tiny really you know it really is um we, we've got a certain amount here and we'll obviously use it uh, judiciously you know we'll use it in the as you say the victoriana um this i tend to use quite a lot of the distillery so heavily peated for example you know i've actually got a single cask in the shop that um that i've uh, you know started uh, selling it, it's only going to be a cask at a time for me um so we've really just got to watch what we do with the peak because there was there was a 10 year old 10 year old uh that was a pt but it's only available in the us and germany so while while you know some of the as i say the, the glen scotia peaties are really quite interesting really you you've really just got to be careful because you don't want to obviously create a rod for your own bar you could get this fantastic run of peaty whiskies and obviously we're not getting enough stock to to feed that demand so yeah we're, we're obviously we're, we're keeping an eye on everything obviously the, as you mentioned the victoriana has got a, you know it's always got a certain amount of peat in it uh this, the 1832 uses some peat in there you know so there's a small amount of peat through different ones sometimes it's undetectable you know the can be five percent peat in some of the, the makeups of these whiskies. So just getting the balance right, just making sure it you know it's it's as it should be. That's I think the only time I've ever tried a, a properly big peaty uh, Grand Scotia, um, outside of some weird and wonderful indie bottlings of the past, is when I came to the distillery and it's like, yeah, have a try of this, you know. But yeah, the so a little sample of a we, we don't only do the things you think we do, we do lots of different things here. So yeah. Um I look forward to you having a lot of stock. So eventually one day I can buy myself a big bottle of Earth Peter Ben Scotia. So um, without having to come all the way to Campbelltown, which much as I love doing so, it's not the easiest place to get to. It's not, it's not, you're right. It's not, you know, and as I say, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm a really big fan of some of these, the, the Glen Scotia PTs. As I say, they're not widely available. You know, it's just random ones. I think I've done a medium PT and I've done a heavily well, the heavily peat is still for sale there uh, when we open up. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really quite interesting. You know, I really, you know, the, the, the flavour profile in there is, you know, is, is uh, quite amazing. But as I say, there's so much to consider there. You know, it's, it's not just the, 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 the new make spirit. It's where, obviously, it's matured. I think it's got a big influence on it. So, um We've talked about the past. We've talked about what you've been putting together so far. So and anything you can sort of let us know about the future of Glen Scotia? Any sort of like, you know, cool, weird, weird and wonderful things happening at the moment? Oh, well, I mean, it's, you know, at the moment, it's, it's, it's just getting her feet back under the table, Billy. You know, it's, it's really just um, trying to, try to, uh, try to get going again and hopefully get the, the shop opened up. Uh, Further on than that, then obviously we'll uh, hopefully uh, consolidate what we've done. Um, as I say, I'm always you know looking for you know casks for the festival, so that'll take up a lot of my time. And you never know, as I say, potentially if we get to the point where we're selling that much Glen Scotia, then we could you know might need to expand at a future date. You don't know. You don't know. So we've really just got to play it by ear and see what happens and um, you know and as I say just steady the ship again because it's been yeah it's been different it really has uh, personally I found it uh, you know it's, it's been quite engaging because I've got to obviously speak to you know a lot of different people myself included Matt Billy and it's been it's really been quite refreshing for me in certain respects so, so yeah yeah Excellent. Keep going. 
And that's literally all we can ask you guys to do is keep going, keep making great whiskey. Um, and uh, yeah, keep getting the whiskey out of Campbelltown somehow and all the way over to us around the world. So, Barbara. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, thank you very much Ian, for having a chat with us today. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to seeing uh, what comes in the future from Glen Scotia. Thank you very much, Billy. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.